Welcome to Make Space, a home design show that empowers you to create spaces you're obsessed with. Tune in for conversations that dive deeper than pinworthy rooms. Host Kara Newhart teases out the essentials of designing spaces that inspire happiness and serve your everyday life. Kara has been featured in House Beautiful, Apartment Therapy, NBC News, and Insider, and has collaborated with brands like Home Depot, Wayfair, World Market, and more. Here's your host, Kara Newhart. Welcome back to Make Space. Today's episode is super special because I have the honor of sitting down with award-winning home designer, Jean Stouffer. Jean is a designer, an entrepreneur, a mom, a grandma, and the Magnolia Network star of The Established Home. Jean just published an incredible book called Establishing Home, and we are here today to dive into not only her vast experience as an incredible designer, all of her expertise and tips for creating spaces you love. But we also get to unpack her story and hear about her journey and all of the lessons she learned while building a successful business, creating incredible spaces, and raising her children. Through Jean's incredible career and amazing spaces, she has so much wisdom to share, not only about practical tips for creating a home you love, but also how to evolve your home depending on the season of your life and really just beautiful insight into kind of the journey and what it looks like to create spaces that support your life. I am so excited and honored to bring you this episode and I hope you walk away with something amazing. So Jean, I am so honored to have you on the show today because not only do you have incredible talent and design expertise that we are so lucky to be able to tap into through this conversation, but I think you have such a grounded point of view and intentionality when it comes to design. So I'm so excited to get your perspective and I know listeners are going to be thrilled to get to hear your story and insights. So welcome to the show today. Well, thank you for having me, Kara. Oh my goodness, of course. So you truly have such an incredible story. So I would really love to start there. What first drew you to home design and how did that spark kind of evolve into your award-winning home design company? Well, it's a it's a very interesting story because I think in some ways it's um, very typical for a lot of people in our industry. And that is that um, I went to school for something completely different. I have Mm -hmm. a business degree with a focus in marketing. And um, I found it difficult to find a job in that field when I graduated from college. And this was a long time ago. This was 1982. Uh (laughs) (laughs) And um, I was newly married. And um, I finally was able to find a job. Um, as being the administrative assistant for an interior designer. Okay. And that was the place where my eyes were opened to design in a way that I'd never seen or had any concept of before. And I, I just, um, you know, even though I was doing all the paperwork for the business, I could clearly see what the business was and what the, the interior designers were doing and I was fascinated. And so they yeah. took me under their wing a bit. And um, at the same time, my husband and I bought our first place and I started just trying my hand at things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one thing led to another. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I was, soon given, you know, an opportunity to help someone else. And that turned into something else, which turned into something else, which turned into Mm -hmm. a business. Yeah, that is so cool. I feel like, you know, that kind of growth of just like one thing leading to the next is Mm -hmm. really how the most incredible thing has come to be is like listening to 
the nudges of whether it's something you're passionate about or something that you're really lit up by. Um, were there any like nudges along the way where you're like, I need to not do this and go this direction that you feel like maybe kind of defined your career? That is such a good question. Um, and actually there are a couple of things. Yes. Um, one, the first one I would say was after I was working for, um, maybe six or seven years and, um, also then started having a family and realizing that the, at the time, the interior design business was very heavy work out of the home because Mm -hmm. it was pre-internet. Right. And so any, any materials or any, um, anything that needed to be shopped for had to be done in person. Right. And so, um, as my family was growing, I, um, was realizing that that was incompatible with what my desire was, which was to be at home with my kids as much as I could be. And, Mm -hmm. but what I found myself gravitating towards was, um, work that was much more analytical, not as not as subjective design, more, more, um, well, it was more kitchens and, and it was, I, I had only dabbled in it, but each, each of the dabbles were so interesting to me. And, um, I would say it was my absolute best work as far as interior design goes. And, um, I, I don't know, maybe it was because, my brain is much more suited, I think, towards more analytical things, although I really uh-huh. love the more artistic flourishes. I, I think I gravitate towards fractions and <laughs> straight right, lines. Right, yeah. <laughs> and and at the, um, that meant all that work, uh, at least the way I was doing it, was just drawing, drafting. Mm which I could do at home. I could do during naps and in the evening. And, um, I really started enjoying it a lot to the point where I, that's exclusively what I did. And then I continued doing that for many, many years. Um, so I would say that was a major point of, um, a nudge that really changed a direction or maybe um there was like a fork in the road maybe is a better right. way of saying it and yeah. i took one of the forks and then yeah. i there was another major time and that's much more recently and that was um after we moved moved to grand rapids michigan after me having spent a lifetime in the chicago area but we mm-hmm. moved to be closer to our kids um three of our adult children had settled here in Grand Rapids and yeah. my husband and I wanted to just, it was a great time of life for us to, to downsize our home. And we thought we would move to Grand Rapids. And, um, after being here and doing a, uh, full house gut remodel to the house that my husband and I ended up living in, um, it was, uh, Grace, my daughter, who was one of the three that was living here, expressed interest in um, helping me, but not in the area that I was interested in, which was the kitchens and bathrooms and floor plans and things like uh-huh. that that I'd been doing for 30 years, but adding right. adding the interior decoration into it, into like the furnishings and draperies and rugs and paint colors and things. Uh And, um, we got a request to do a project just like that. And so I reached out to Grace and said, Hey, there's an opportunity. Uh Are you serious? (laughs) Because she was Uh teaching school at the time. And, um, she said, absolutely. And so we took it on and that was 2016. And that has been a major change. Uh, like, so I kind of went back to interior design, but in a much different way. 
Wow, that's so cool. So is Grace the only one of your children that works directly with you or? No, actually. um, Now all four of them do. We have. Oh, wow. We, um, our son, John, is our photographer and is Uh our, um, also our marketing director. And he's the one that lives in Chicago with his family. And um, our, my oldest son, Dave, is has been the general contractor on a couple of projects where we've purchased the house and he's done he's managed the whole construction process he's working on one right now that's going to be two episodes of um our season two with a, the established home on magnolia uh-huh. and yeah. and then our youngest son is um in charge of sales for our cabinetry and kitchen design division. Yeah. Wow. That is so fun that everyone gets to be involved. That's so cool. Yeah. And then my husband basically does everything that no, that there's no job title for, but has to be done. Uh Like the (laughs) catch-all. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Oh my gosh. That's so fun. Well, okay. So what I first want to dive more into, and I'm sure we'll pick up more pieces of your story through our conversation, but it's so exciting that you have this new book that's coming out. And I wanted to kind of uncover, you know, what, maybe what prompted you to write the book? Mm. Well, boy, it was quite the experience writing it. Um, the first time I've done it and, um, I was so happy for this opportunity that was given to me because, um, I've spent quite a bit of time mentoring young women in various aspects of life, and I have enjoyed it so much. And now that we have, you know, a lot of um, employees, many of them are young women. And in a way, I feel sort of like it's not just a boss relationship, but also a mentoring one. And um, I have, I received so many, um, inquiries and direct messages from, from people of all ages who have questions about all kinds of things. They, they see what we're doing in business and they see how we're living our personal life and in involving family. And they have so many questions about just how did that happen? How do you keep it going? Um, and when I was given this opportunity, I just was thrilled because I felt like by telling my story, I could answer a lot of those questions. And then by just telling the story versus writing like prescriptives, people could kind of think about how it might relate to them and their unique story. So I was just so happy to be able to do it. Oh, that is so amazing. You know, I think it's so cool that it's you're, you're using your story as kind of just an example and then infusing the design into it. So it's not just pretty spaces or how to achieve those. It's really kind of like living life. Mm-hmm. Because one of the greatest ways people learn. And I also think as designers, people often see our work as, matching pillows and picking paint colors, but Mm -hmm. there's a depth to what we do. That's really, we're helping people discover themselves and then express those things, whether they're needs or wants or personality traits through their homes with the designs we create for them. So how do you use design as a tool for uncovering what people really need for their spaces and kind of, you know, create those rooms to support them? Hmm. Well, um, I'm sure you experience this a lot when you're working. Good design um, has to be both functional and beautiful, I think. Mm, yes. And, and so we, I spend quite a bit of time learning what people's needs are, um, what their family structure is, when they have people over, what does that look like? Um, what they're, how they view cleaning and maintenance. Mm. 
because yeah. that really influences a lot. And I get to learn a lot about people and about their families and about their um, just things that are really important to them. And we, we keep that list of things and then we get to know them more and more as we're working on the project. So we get a better feel for things as, as things go along. But um, it's also, it's cool because it's what helps make every project unique is that every person yeah. is unique. And so yeah. just, you know, cutting and pasting a design is never, ever going to work. But the beauty of having a different house and a different client means that you get to come up with all kinds of different ideas because each person is so unique. Mm. Yeah, that is so cool. So, and I love that approach. I think being so personal and really centering, you know, the client's life before the design comes in is really the mark of a great designer. Um, <laughs> but what do you feel about your book? I, I'm sure it's partly, you know, the design work you've always done is obviously in there in terms of like inspo photos and strategies. But what, um, while you were writing it, kind of, did you get to go beyond that and really kind of make a holistic picture of your life? I guess, what was that process like? Well, it was, um, it, it, it was very all encompassing, I have to say, because, mm -hmm. um, I went, I reached way back, you know, into even childhood. And what was so interesting is, um, by doing that, I'm not a very introspective person. So, yeah. um, I kind of just look forward a lot and punch forward. So this mm -hmm. required me to look back and what was so fascinating was to see that all these different experiences that I had, um, that might've seemed random, 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 or might've mm -hmm. seemed, oh, just like, um, that was a coincidence. I realized that it was all orchestrated in a sense. Um, I, you know, I'm a person of faith, so I really believe that um, God was orchestrating my path. And yeah. it really wasn't until I looked back and recounted a lot of it that I realized how amazing it is that um, just the things that happened and the decisions that I made at certain times, how impactful they were going forward and how thankful I was to have, um, good people around me. Um, yeah. like the, I would say the comfort of prayer and, and being able to receive counsel from wise people, godly people, and just listening to, in my own heart, the way to go. I, I particularly remember one circumstance where soon after I, that my kitchen business had kind of taken off, um, or at least I was getting some traction, um, I was given the opportunity to take on a massive piece of business that would have kept me busy for years, full time, and then some. And this is when my youngest was two years old. Mm -hmm. And wow. it was a huge decision because it was like the opportunity of a lifetime. Right. Or at least I thought it was. But I also had this foreboding feeling like, yeah, but the thing that I really felt like I wanted most to do, why I even ended up in the kitchen business anyway, was to spend, to be with my kids when they were home. And right. I... I just had to weigh this and I finally just um, said no to that, not knowing mm. if it would ever, anything like that would ever materialize again, you know? Right. Yeah. Looking Which back. Which I'm sure took so much courage at the time. It did. It did. Yeah. But at the same time, I knew it was the right thing to do, mm. mm -hmm. you know? So there, that helps a lot when you know that. Right. But um, looking back, I'm so thankful because I was able to invest in all my kids, not just the older ones. Um, 
And as a result, I have solid relationships with them. Um, and not that you can't, you know, but I knew for me, that's what, that's what I needed to do. And, um, I look back at it and realize it was a real moment that I'm really thankful for actually. Yeah. Wow. That's so cool. Well, I think, you know, in telling your story, I'm sure there's so many different facets of it that different people are going to walk away with different lessons or different inspiration. But when you were putting the book together, what was kind of your biggest hope in terms of how your story would impact your readers? Well, um, I wanted them to, first of all, just to be encouraged that you don't have to be, um, I don't know, a superstar or, um, you know, a young whiz to be able to make your Mm -hmm. mark. It wasn't until I was, you know, in my late fifties that, um, anything, I mean, I had a nice business, but I worked alone pretty much for a long time and nothing too extraordinary happened to me. Um, Uh and it wasn't until much later in life. Yeah. Late fifties that, um, I was able to do some things that are, are pretty unusual, pretty amazing. Mm. And I think it, it might give, um, some women, maybe more my stage of life, the, maybe the inspiration to go for it. You know, if they've always wanted, they, they are an artist, but they've always just kind of kept it on the down low maybe it's time, you know, Uh if they're, I I have a friend that went to law school when she was 50 and she's now she's, um, the CEO of our company. So Uh I, I just, I feel like, um, for people that might want to look at these years as like kind of the winding down waning years, if there's still some sort of creative energy that you have, pursue it. So I, I yeah. hope that's a, it's an encouragement in that way to people more, more my stage of life. And then the mm-hmm. other thing was, I, I'm just hoping it's an encouragement to people in more my kids stage of life, you know, where I was a generation right. ago, where I was um, enjoying working, but had a real heart to be home with my kids. And yeah. um, how to how to balance that effectively without regret. And Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot in the book about that. Yeah, that is so cool because, you know, I think through design, I believe our homes are ever evolving. Um, Mm -hmm. And I am personally on a mission to help people, you know, learn how to take charge of that process and make changes to their home so that it grows as they do um, Mm -hmm. and really supports them along the way. And I think, you know, design isn't a one and done endeavor. I'm sure, I'm sure mm. you know. But um, do you have any tips, kind of in in highlighting those different phases of life? But tips for the everyday person who's looking to evolve their home in small ways to make it better support them and their family, kind of as you go through these different cycles and phases in your life. Yeah, I do. Um, I know, at least when I was younger, um, budget was big deal for me. Um, Mm -hmm. I didn't have a lot of extra money to go out and buy whatever piece of furniture I wanted, you know? And so I often found, um, used pieces either at garage sales or estate sales, or now it could be Facebook marketplace and, um, just either fix them up or painted them or just clean them a lot of times Mm -hmm. And some of those pieces I still use in my house today because um, they're good, pretty old vintage pieces. And um, they, there's nothing like a, 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 the patina of a vintage piece to put Mm -hmm. into a room, even of all new furnishings that make the room feel, uh, have a little bit of more hmm, personality and like collected feeling to it. Right. So 
I would say that's one aspect. Another another thing that I think is kind of a fun way to evolve a design is with things that are living. So um, plants and you know trees and those are a lot of bang for the buck. Um, so you can fill up a corner, you know, with a tree and have it just not only fill space, you know, especially in those years where you not can't necessarily buy things to fill the space, but right. it also adds this um, the feeling of something alive, <laughs> which is so yeah. nice. Yeah. So simple, but so, so impactful for sure. Yeah. And then I think about paint is a big thing. You can transform a space with paint so quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think um, my philosophy has always been to, for a high end look, to tone down um, the brightness of a color with either brown or gray. And it just mm. has much more staying power and uh, kind of a timeless look than something very clear and bright. Yes. Um, I often, when I'm helping people, um, when I'm consulting with people, if it's not a full project of ours and I'm just consulting with people, oftentimes they'll bring colors to the table. And um, my tips, m my recommendation to them often is, let's find this, but more brown. Or this, but more uh -huh. gray, and yes. um, it really, really helps. Yes, you're speaking my language. I love those muted tones because they they are so much brighter too when you put them on a wall than you'd ever think. Like it looks gray on a swatch, but you put that same color on a wall, it has so much vibrance that you wouldn't expect when you're comparing it to like the bright hue of the same that color. That is so true, Kara. Yeah. Yeah, there's really nothing is. like oh seeing a little one inch by one inch, um, you know, like mm, pink on a, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> on a color card <laughs> and then translating that to an entire room and you feeling like you just walked into a Pepto-Bismol <laughs> bottle. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and I've learned that the hard way, matching like a, a swatch to a pillow, like, oh, I'll get mm. this exact color. And then it's way too bright. <laughs> yes, we've all made that mistake. <laughs> Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's like a, a rite of passage for picking color, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, some of us need to learn it more than once, but <laughs> uh -huh. I did for sure. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> we'll get back to the conversation after a quick word from our sponsor. Do you ever feel like you have all the right information from the podcast, from YouTube, from social media, on how to create the space of your dreams, but you just don't know how to apply those tips and those strategies to your specific space, it can be so challenging. But I finally have a way to help you out one-on-one. -on -one. You can book a DIY coaching session with me or a design consultation. So if you wanna tackle this space yourself, you just need a little guidance and YouTube is becoming hard to navigate, I'll help you plan and tackle your home DIY project, including answering all your questions and helping you troubleshoot and pivot if you've started and you feel stuck. Or if what you need is more of the design strategy, you can book a design consultation. We'll meet on Zoom and talk strategies for your specific space. We can do a deep dive into one room, go over everything that needs to be fixed or changed in the space and create a plan for you to make that happen. Or we can give your whole house some therapy and do a home walkthrough talking about how to create cohesiveness in your space and assessing your whole house at the same time. This is the perfect next step if you've been loving the podcast, you love the strategies, but you're not quite sure how to create a space you're obsessed with because you need hands-on personalized help. We got this. I am here for you. Just book a coaching session or a design consultation and we will get hands-on with your space. Just go to calendly.com slash Kara Newhart or find the link in the show notes to book so we can sit down one-on-one -on -one and tackle your space. And now back to the interview. So, okay, I'm loving all these tips. And, you know, my listeners are really here to find these strategies for taking charge of creating the home that they love. And I think along with that comes this sort of like quest for knowledge, which is mm. like finding the best tips and strategies that can really get them to the finish line of that gorgeous space 
that, you know, fits their life and supports them. Um, but I think it can be really overwhelming with all kinds of amazing inspiration, especially online, on social media, on Pinterest, sure. Um, sure. and all different approaches to design. You know, everyone approaches design so differently. Um, and so I'd love to just draw on your experience and see, do you have like a few key lessons that you think could help the everyday woman as she's navigating this? Maybe like a cheat code on how to find what style and approach works best for you and your home? Mm-hmm. Boy, isn't that a big question because of all the resources that are available at our fingertips now to see real-time design all the time. Yes. Yes. And it, um, I have this phrase that I use, it's Pinterest dysphoria. Mm. I, it's very hard. Um, if you like design, you probably like a lot of different kinds of design and, um, wanting to incorporate all of it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I, I think that that is a big issue nowadays, um, because of everything that's so available to see so quickly And so I guess my tip on this would be um, to use something like Pinterest or the Instagram save feature to to save only whole rooms that appeal to you. I think it's oftentimes Mm -hmm. tempting. Oh, I like that door. Oh, I like that color. Oh, I like that couch. Oh, I like that light fixture, whatever. But I think it would be nice to have a a separate board or file where you only pin whole rooms that speak to you. And then um, go back every few weeks or something and look at them and see if there's a pattern. Mm. See if there's something that keeps coming up, a look that that you just keep coming back to. Um, You might see something that you love on Tuesday. But that's the only, but it was exciting and new. And then weeks go by and nothing like that ever comes up again that you want to save. Right. So I I think um, take your time in this discovery phase and put together um, inspiration of whole rooms that speak to you and then come Mm -hmm. back and review to see if there's a pattern. Yeah. You know, I think that is even more impactful than we might even think at first, because I think the everyday person is probably so good at picking out elements that are amazing and painting those, but it's a true designer that is experienced in that art of curation and how to incorporate those elements into a cohesive space. So Mm -hmm. by really seeking out the full space, you are getting to pull on, you know, that experience of, creating something cohesive and you're not what I call like Frankensteining your design where it's like, I'll take this and this and this and patch it together. And like hope yes. It works. yes, yes, yeah. yes. That's, that's a great descriptor. Yeah. Because if you just want to include literally everything you love in one space, you do create a Frankenstein. That's, I might use that Kara. Yeah, <gasps> you should. And I'm going to tell people to pin whole rooms. I like this step. We'll trade. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's so good. It's especially, and I I think another thing would be, um, you know, since I've spent so much of my life really focusing on kitchens, um, that's an area that, uh, you know, if you keep pinning the same kind of kitchen, that's probably what you love. And you might see something, um, you know, I don't know what, but um, that's crazy and fun, but but it's probably not something you're going to want to live with. Right. Yeah. And I think there's an art to like respecting good design and even saving it and also realizing like this isn't necessarily for me and my house. Like you can appreciate mm-hmm. right. beautiful, fun design, and not be for you. And learning how right. to do that is challenging, but essential. Well, and then the other piece of that is a lot of times our houses like kind of dictate things. Yes. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you have a, 
I guess, you know, if you have a salt box colonial, turning it into a, a Spanish or Mediterranean something is probably not going to work, you know? Right. right. So you've got to kind of respect what you're working with, too. And uh, oftentimes, mm -hmm. those are great guardrails because it automatically yes. disqualifies a bunch of things that you might otherwise want. But no, this house is not going to work with that. Yes, exactly. I always say it's harder to create in a blank space than it is to start with something because it's like those constraints act as your filters to weed out like half of the decisions. It's so true. You don't have to. Yeah. It's really true. Yeah. I think that's why um, for so many years, I only uh, worked on remodels because mm -hmm. of those. I, I felt a lot of comfort in those constraints. Yeah. Yeah. I think it really lets creativity shine too. It's like, you can't change this. So what can you do that's so creative to make it like work? I love right. that challenge. Yeah. For yeah. sure. Yeah. So kind of with this process, I think it can be so tempting to like rush the journey of designing spaces and try to get to that end goal as quickly as possible. Like have the space, have it finished, have that after photo. Um, mm -hmm. But do you have some insight into maybe why it can be important to shift the focus like to slowing down and really enjoying the journey? Well, I think it's um, kind of been pushed on us in the last couple of years just because of um, supply chain things. But I, um, I definitely think that there's certain things like even level of craftsmanship that is only possible if it's done slowly and with care. Mm -hmm. And um, I think relating this more to a remodeling or redecorating uh, point of view is probably easier. Um, but I, I do think I discovered things in the room and in the space um, as I've gone in remodeling projects that whether it's, you know, how lights coming in in a certain way or um, ability to open up something that I didn't think was possible before, but allowing um, the time to discover those things and the time to allow the, the craftsmen to do their work without, mm. you know, putting another one right on top of them behind them that, um, you know, would make life difficult for everyone. So, uh huh. Yeah. And yeah, that's so funny. While you were saying yeah. that, it's like I, I kind of got the analogy of like a flower like blooming and it's like if you rush it it won't be ready and it won't like mm. look right you could pull all the petals open but it's like not gonna evolve in the time that it needs to look its best yeah so that's really good insight for sure yeah yeah it's we do try to um you know plan out every space all together so that um, we think of everything. We make sure we have outlets in the right places and, um, you know, everything like that. And that the tile patterns line up with where the shower head's going to be. And so there is definitely something that's re that pre planning a lot yeah. of the space in advance is kind of crucial to an end result. But there is also the openness, I would say, to shifting if something presents itself that could be so much better. Mm hmm Yeah. I love that. I feel like I err towards that and just like, let's see what happens and I need to work more on the planning. But I think when you balance both is like the sweet spot because you really yeah. consider everything you need to so you're on track, but then you also are still open to yeah. things being better than you planned. The other thing that I think about a lot, um, and especially since I um, traveled to England recently and was reminded of this, is that um, there's a lot of imperfection in homes. Mm -hmm. And whether it's a out of plumb wall or a, you know, uneven floor or a scuff on something, there's a lot of imperfection. And in these old, old homes in England, 
it's embraced. They don't rip up everything to try to make everything level. They just work with what they've got. Yeah. And it leads to this kind of cozy, comfortable, lived in look. And I think um, I'm trying to do this a lot more when I'm presented with the option, do I rip it out because it's not perfect? It's, you know, it's old, it's scratched, it's, you know, the floor has a stain on it. Um, we can't get it out even sanding. Do I, I'm, I'm trying to really think more carefully about those things and embrace something that um, still functions really well, but isn't um, like it isn't perfect. And yes. that could even go with patina on furniture. You know, if you have mm-hmm. some, you know, surface scratches or a ring from a glass, it's maybe not all bad. Right. Yeah. And that those things could be part of a story that makes the design have like this depth that you couldn't get if it was brand new. Right. I think about a huge question I get often is I love marble. I want marble countertops in my kitchen, but I'm just so afraid of, you know, what'll happen to it. Mm -hmm. And so my, my answer is, well, you can embrace what happens to it and it becomes part of your story of the space, Uh but not everyone can do that. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So, but I, I think it would be cool if more of us could do it. I really do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think it has really cool implications across the board from like saving money to more sustainability to, you know, fixing a lot of the struggles of feeling like things have to be new and perfect. And so I think if we could all embrace it, it would be, it'd be cool. It'd just be part of the way things are. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. So I want to talk about the show, but my (laughs) question before that is what's one of the biggest challenges you, you feel like people, uh, face with their homes and maybe how can creating an intentional design be can, kind of the solution to help overcome that? Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of the um, people that we work for have reached a point in their home where it just doesn't function the way they need it to for their family any longer. And mm-hmm. it could be that their family has grown um, and you know, they need places for more coats, bigger coats, bigger shoes, sports equipment, you know, that kind of more places at the table, more bedrooms, or, or it's getting smaller. And they, um, you know, a couple might want something that they can close the door on and travel and have it be more maintenance free. And um, so I would say life changes are the biggest reasons why people come to us. They want their home to work better for their family. I like that. Yeah. It feels like, you know, your home is either kind of expanding through growth phases or contracting through different phases. And so Mm -hmm. really, you know, making the design fit that whatever you're doing is yeah going to work best for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so you have your book coming out, but you also have a whole TV series on Magnolia Network. So how did your show, The Established Home, get its start? Well, this is just a great story. Um, And I think there's, you know, a lot of times things happen because many different things happen and it all adds up to something. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the case here. And um, yeah. When Grace and I started working together, um, my son, John, uh, who's our photographer and also um, was very active on Instagram as a photographer when it was just starting out, um, he, in about 2016, he said, you know, mom, design has not been on Instagram so far, but I can tell you it's starting to happen. So even Mm -hmm. though I've told you not to put your work up there before, I think now's the time. So um, I did start putting our work up there both 
images that he'd taken and um, images I just took with my phone in a way that how he coached me to take them. Right. And so our work started getting out there on Instagram. So that was a thing because mm-hmm. eventually Joanna Gaines saw our work on Instagram. And so yeah. that was a big factor. But it wasn't just that. It was that John and his wife, Maura, were um, hired by the Magnolia Journal, you know, their quarterly magazine, to uh-huh. do some photo shoots. And so Joanna and Chip had met John and wow, kind of put, oh, John Stouffer. Oh, wait, Jean Stouffer. And started uh-huh. putting some things together. And, um, and, and then just some other little smaller random things. But, um, so finally I got a call from someone from the Magnolia network saying, Hey, we'd like to talk to you about something. And at that time it was just doing one, one show for a series, doing the pilot for a series that's now called point of view, a designer's profile. And, um, and she talked to me about like what it might look like and if they were to be interested, would I be interested? And, you know, it just kind of talked like that. And, and I kind of brought it to the family and we all decided that, okay, it's just one, one episode. What could be the harm in giving it a try? Mm -hmm. And you don't have to commit to anything more than that. And so we did. And I was so impressed with how, um, what the network's mission was for their shows of just inspiring Uh and, um, uplifting and having it be time well spent, you know, because a lot of TV is not time well spent. Right. There's manufactured drama and bad design and you know, right. like, I it's really just don't kind of like fanfare. Of yeah. And a reason to check out. Yeah. But to be intentional about it. That's so beautiful. Yeah. So they did just a beautiful job. The production company that was the ones involved in filming it and editing it did just artful work. And mm-hmm. so when Magnolia called and said, would you be interested and having your own series, I, I felt like I could trust what we did with them. I could, mm-hmm. I could trust having our story portrayed by them in an inspiring, in, in a way that would inspire others. Uh-huh. So, wow. That's so cool. Yeah. So we're so now what? in the middle of, um, we're actually towards the end of filming for season two in the Uh next, um, in the next six weeks, we're going to be completing seven projects and filming them for reveals. Oh my goodness. It's going to be crazy. (laughs) So busy. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's awesome. So how has having this series like changed your business and maybe even your life? Like what's been kind of like, you know, the big changes? Yeah. Well, I've had to get a lot of help. That's one thing Mm -hmm. because, um, filming a television series takes quite a bit of time. And, um, you know, I worked a lot before that started. So I had to get help with doing a lot of the other things that, you know, paperwork things and just drawing the designs I conceive into mechanical drawings and ordering everything and following up on the orders. And, um, so getting some good help around me has been a, been a big thing. And it's been really fun because it's also involved all the kids and Mm -hmm. being able to be with them a lot while filming the projects that they're involved in has been so fun for me. Oh, that's amazing. So just really enjoyed it. It's it's made it possible for me to do things like this, you know, as people get to to know us. Um and yeah. a really cool thing is being giving the oppor- having the opportunity to write the book. Um mm. and I so you know, and just tell that story 
I think it's opened a lot of doors, I think. Yeah. Did you ever, ever imagine you'd be writing a book or have your own TV series? Absolutely never. (laughs) (laughs) In fact, almost everything that I'm doing right now, I never imagined I would be doing. And in fact, it was never a dream to do. Right. I just, honestly, I assumed I would just keep designing custom kitchens until I thought it was time to retire. And that was just it. (laughs) And hold a lot of grandbabies. (laughs) Uh huh. Oh, it's so amazing though that you found such a big passion of a career and then a platform to share your story and your life. Yeah, that's so beautiful. It's a gift. Yeah, and I'm really grateful for it. I love it. Well, so I want to dive into kind of like a speed round of quick tips, but first I want to let everyone know when they can get the book. I will link it in the show notes. But when does it officially come out? Well, there are two dates here. Um, okay. Its official launch is November 1st, but the publisher um, has, you know, talking about the supply chain, the books probably will not ship um, to people that buy them until about the 14th or 15th of November. Okay. So good to know ahead of time. Mm-hmm. You can order mm-hmm. it, but <laughs> you might have to be patient. And that's okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> pre-orders are going on now. And okay, yeah. um, we are doing a book signing at Magnolia Silobration at the end of October. Oh. And we are having books for that. They, yeah. they specially got books for that. So those the people oh, that go so there fun. are going to be special because they'll get right? a book before anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so good to know. If you want to be special, show up for that. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then what's the base, best place to connect with you online, whether it's like inspiration or just kind of following your journey and your story? Well, the most up-to-date um, place is Instagram, and it's just Jean Stouffer Design. Um, okay. And I, I post on there, and I also do stories about process like and family. So kind of right. what's happening personally and then what's happening on projects. And then usually my fee just has the the completed projects on it. Yeah, that's so fun. So everyone hop over to Instagram, follow mm-hmm. Jean. Um, but let's <laughs> dive into some quick tips. I have just a few questions of just kind of design basics and tips. Um, and just kind of the first thing that comes to mind. <laughs> okay. So number All right. one. Lightning round. Right? <laughs> Right, lightning round. No pressure. <laughs> so number one, um, what advice do you have for finding or creating your style? Um, I would say just look at completed rooms, whether they're in magazines mm-hmm. or online, and see what appeals to you over and over and over. Look for those themes. I love that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So number two, what is your best tip for navigating color? We might have already spoiled this Mm -hmm. one earlier, but. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, um, I love color, but I think it works best if you give it a lot of neutral um, runway. So Mm. like I, I really love using light neutrals in big spaces like halls and stairways and and great rooms and then yeah. reserve some really um rich colors for smaller rooms like offices powder rooms bedrooms mm-hmm. i love that it's a really good strategy mm-hmm. um number three do you have a go-to strategy that you feel like can improve the look or function in almost any room yes i think it's edit a lot of times there's just too much in a room. Mm -hmm. And so removing stuff usually is a good start. Yes. I love that. I feel like the go-to solution a lot is to add something when there's a problem, but to edit as the first step can Mm -hmm. be way more impactful sometimes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the next question is how do you approach balancing function and aesthetics in a space? Well, you know, thankfully now it's pretty easy because um, of the great fabrics and finishes that are available. Um, And so like we can put a white couch somewhere now 
and know mm-hmm. that that just pull off that slip cover and wash it and you're all good yep. because <laughs> because of this great uh, performance fabric. But I also think um, kind of going back to this other thing that we were talking about of embracing imperfection mm-hmm. is is important for because you really might want that marble like we were right. talking about, but it's going to get patina. And so um, the function is that it's going to get patina, but the style is that you love the marble. So right. balance it by embracing the patina. Yeah, that's powerful. Um, so next question is, what is your best tip when it comes to lighting? Mm. Uh well, a lot of times we now have rooms open to each other or open concept, and it requires right. um, a lot of lighting. And we we don't like recessed cans. We don't use them very often at all. So we're okay. balancing a lot of different decorative fixtures. And so my tip on this is to change the mass with the fixtures that you can see if you can see them together. And what I mean by that is like, if you have a chandelier with several arms in one area, then put a shaded pendant in another. So the airiness and mass changes. Yeah. So there's strong variety. Right. I like that. So why don't we like recess lights? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think they've been overused. Um, and, true, true. And so I think part of it's a reaction to that. But the other part is that manufacturers are coming up with these fantastic tiny flush mounts where they're like four or five inches in diameter and, um, you know, maybe three inches tall. And they're so pretty. Yeah. So it adds a decorative element and provides light. So there you go with your form. Win, win. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Perfect. So look for those instead. I love that. Yeah. Um, So next question, do you have advice for how to tweak your home or design style so that it evolves over time and kind of changes with your season of life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think buying any furniture that you buy, whether it's used or new, think of it as... um, something that could go like you could move from room to room or house to house. And so Mm. a lot of, um, design itches can, no, yeah. Design itches can be scratched by just rearranging furniture. Uh Uh-huh. Trying, you know, that piece that used to be a sofa table in the hall as a console, you know, and making these, this cute, dressing or dresser make it an end table or and so I I just feel like if you buy nice pieces that are neutral you can do all kinds of things with them and feel have it be fresh a lot Mm, I love that so give yourself kind of a blank canvas of basics that are kind of your investment pieces that you can rework over time yeah. as you like evolve your style. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good plan. <laughs> and then final question. So what are your best tips for pivoting when something goes wrong with a project or a design doesn't work out the way you thought it would? Okay. That's such a good question because that happens all the time. Yes. <laughs> and um, I, I think there's a lot of points to this. And I think one is... Um, the sooner you can admit or embrace that what you had in your mind's eye isn't going to happen, the better. Mm, Um, So that's, that's a good thing. Cause sometimes, you know, you just want to say, no, I just want to fight for this, but it's just, it's Uh not, you can't. Right. Um, Right. (laughs) Yeah. And if it's a mistake that you made, the faster you can admit to that, the better and without Mm. blaming others. Yeah. And I think, too, what's so great about design is that there are so many ways to skin a cat. 
There are so yeah. many ways to make something beautiful. And um, sometimes, honestly, some of my biggest things where the thing that I thought I wanted to have happen, we discovered at some point during the process, it just couldn't. The, the adaptation that I had to come up with, given the circumstances, was so much better than what I had originally thought of. Yes. Oh my gosh. I feel that so deeply. It's like Bob Ross calls them happy little accidents. I feel like every time I've messed up, my solution has been a million times better than the original plan. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you, and also the other way to um, look at things, and this is related, not exactly the question you're asking, but I've definitely made some mistakes that have cost money on jobs, Mm -hmm. both personally and for clients ordered the wrong scale light fixture, the electrician installs it and calls me over and says, do you want this? Really? It's all installed. So it's not going to be returned and it is wrong, you know? And so that's an example. And I always, um, I lately I've been reframing these, um, mistakes that cost money as tuition Mm. instead of, instead of costing me money, what can I learn from this? You know, wow. what process can I put in place? Or, you know, the fact that I didn't go to design school and pay for the design school, I'm like, okay, uh-huh. here's paying tuition. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. Cause it really is like, there's such value in the lesson and it's so hard to see that value when it isn't tangible and you have like a dollar value of the mistake <laughs> staring yes. at you. So yes. to reframe and just put it in that bucket of tuition and I paid to learn is right. That is cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It helps a lot. It yeah. also just really helps, um, just emotionally to accept things in that way because then you can get up and go on right and you're not beating yourself up or spiraling right Right. yes I love it so much well thank you so much for your time honestly this episode is incredible and I cannot wait to share it I'm like so beyond excited to put this out there Kara thanks for the opportunity I really do appreciate it oh my gosh of course I had the best time (laughs) I'm on my way back home. Thanks for listening. If this is your first time listening in, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you can stay in the loop with the newest episodes. If you're a subscriber and you love the show, be sure to rate, review, or screenshot and share your favorite episode on social.